Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Andy Borowitz. I write for The New Yorker. Um, thank you. I, I write under the pen name Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know if you're, <laughs> yes, that's familiar with my work. Thank you. It's very exciting. No, I don't know how I do it either, but I, I just knock them out of the park every time. You know, before we begin tonight, I have to thank somebody uh, without whom the New Yorker Festival uh, couldn't happen because she organizes the whole thing every year. Rhonda Sherman is here. Let's hear it for Rhonda. Now, when um, Rhonda is an old friend, and when she, she asked me to do Last year's New Yorker Festival, she said, uh, and this was, this was kind of a big selling point for me, she said, doing the New Yorker Festival uh, can really lead to, to bigger things. And um, it's a year later, and I'm doing the New Yorker Festival. <laughs> now, I know that sounds like kind of a, a, lateral, a lateral move. Um, but uh, in the magazine business right now, that's considered a win. We want to be moving sideways. We, we don't want to be moving down. We don't want to be, we like to keep it, keep it sideways. But um, Rhonda, Rhonda asked me to do the show last year and I had such a great time. And I gotta say, it's a special feeling, the New Yorker Festival, and it's really a treat uh, for a comedian. Uh, and I, th I think it's because, it's, be it's because of you. Uh, the audiences are so amazing. They're so smart and uh, so sophisticated, uh, or, or as the French say, sophisticate. Um, and I really, I'm not sucking up to you at all. I'm, I'm not. It's you are the smartest people in the world, really, <laughs> because you read the New Yorker. That's right. That's right. Or, or you pretend to, and and that's. I mean, you get the New Yorker, and maybe it, you know, it piles up. You know, maybe everyone has that pile, you know, on the nightstand or whatever, and and that's cool. Um, you know, but at that point, really, once it's in the pile, I feel like reading it is a formality in a way. I mean, really. I mean, don't be a hero on our account. You don't. Don't feel the need. I mean, once it's in the pile, I mean, reading it is kind of pretentious, don't you think? I think it's kind of phonies read the New Yorker. Just keep it in the pile. That's that's cool. But but you you know you are um, you know tremendously tremendously smart and and sophisticated and and I know this because I've I performed to lots of different audiences in my career like. A couple years ago, I performed at the New York Post Festival. <laughs> oh. I mean, I opened with a joke about Baudelaire, okay? <laughs> and in French, I gotta tell you, it just died. I mean, it just laid, it just laid there. It was like crickets. It was. Uh, but like you guys, because you read the New Yorker, you get it anyway. You guys are probably all like fluent in French, probably like. I mean, you'd have to be just to get through some of those Adam Gopnik pieces, right? You'd have to, you'd have to, because like he he lived in France, like he lived in Paris, France, for like a couple years, and he came back, and now he's like he's like writing in Fringlish, you know? I mean, it's like every other word is like crepe Suzette or something, and. You have to be pretty, pretty sharp to keep up with that sort of thing, which you guys, you guys, have, I mean, you made it here, okay, this place is a French, this is a named a French thing, and you guys found it okay, right? Le Poisson Rouge, I don't have to tell you what that means, the poison makeup, yeah, you, you got here, no problem, no Google Maps necessaire. You're just, it's right here. Well, it's, it's so exciting to be here, and I'm going to explain what this evening's entertainment is. Because here's the thing. 
I feel like when you go to a night of the theater, there should be full disclosure about what's going to happen on the stage. Do you agree with that? Like, you want to know. Because, like, I love the theater, but sometimes you'll go to a Broadway show, and they don't tell you what you're in for, and then you're there and you're stuck. And, and you have, like, maybe they'll have, like, in the lobby, they'll have, like, a couple of cards that'll say, like, a change in the cast, like if somebody, like, an understudy is coming on, or maybe they'll be, like, there is a gunshot in Act 2, so if you have a heart condition, you should be aware of that. But that's it. They don't really tell you all the things that they should warn you. I actually, you know what? I did this. I wrote up a list of things. This is like, these are some warnings I think they should have in Broadway theaters uh, in the lobby. And it's just a few. I just want to share these with you. And maybe you agree with some of these. Okay, this is for, you walk in the lobby, you'd see this. Warning. Owing to a typographical error, the Times review of this play omitted the word horrible. <laughs> That'd be a good thing. Okay, here's another one. Warning. When the curtain rises, you may be startled by the sight of a former movie star's ravaged face. <laughs> that's, well, you should be prepared emotionally. Full disclosure. Warning. During this afternoon's performance, there will be a chatty women's group from Long Island seated directly behind you. It's good to know. Warning. The lead actor in tonight's play is a veteran of the Royal Shakespeare Company who always showers the first five rows with spittle. It's good to know. Warning. Tonight's show features music by Andrew Lloyd Webber. That's good to know what you're in for. Warning. This play has a title that is very similar to another play currently on Broadway, which is the one you meant to buy tickets for. <laughs> Warning. Tom Stoppard found the play you were about to see confusing. <laughs> now, I did that joke at the New York Post Festival. Nothing. <laughs> Warning. The role usually played by Sir Ian McKellen will be performed tonight by the actor who played Isaac on The Love Boat. <laughs> Warning. To enjoy tonight's show, it is necessary to have read the complete works of Baudelaire in French. And finally, warning. In Act 3, there is full frontal nudity, but not involving the actor you would like to see naked. <laughs> so those are some warnings. Um, none of those apply to tonight's entertainment. Now let me explain to you, have any of you guys seen The Moth before? Do we have any people who have seen The Moth? Or maybe you heard it on the radio, downloaded the podcast? Well, um, The Moth is this, is this very, very special New York institution. It's, it's good old-fashioned storytelling. And people get up here just in front of the microphone. They don't bring notes. Uh, they just tell their stories from beginning, the middle to the end, and, and that's it. Now, stories uh, can take all forms. They can be true stories, like the stories that David Sedaris tells, or they can be totally made-up stories, like the stories Rick Sanchez tells. Um, but, um, but in the case of The Moth, they like to tell um, really true stories. Now, think about this for a minute. Uh, the moth is committed to the truth, and you know how committed to the truth the New Yorker is, because they have those legendary fact checkers, right? Like if you if you are writing a piece and you use the name like Jesus Christ, they will check that to make sure that that was a person that's real. So it's like they are really, and so you put like the moth and the New Yorker together, there is going to be so much truth on this stage, it will blind you. It will blind you. So are you, are you guys ready for that? Are you prepared? Okay. Well, now, I want to um, reintroduce uh, Leo Carey at this point, because Leo, in addition to being the deputy books editor and the guy who reminds everybody to turn off their cell phones, he is also our timekeeper this evening. And all the stories have to be roughly about 10 minutes long. And at, at the 10-minute mark, what Leo's going to do a little warning. What are you going to What are you going to do, Leo? You'll play a note. Okay, can we see? Can we see that, or is that extra? 
to actually. Okay, very nice. And then um, that, that is a signal that they've got maybe one or two minutes to, to wrap up. And at, at that point, oh, I've forgotten that stage. Okay. it's an awfully good thing that we're bringing it up now, isn't it, Leah? That's a, that you, then, you then have to do something to kind of. So maybe a quiet note to start with. Right? Yeah, a quiet note. And then, okay, and then what are you going to do to sort of really indicate that they Okay. Let's hear it for Leo Carey. Sort of making it up as he goes along. I'm very casual about his job here. Now, um, we, have, we have five storytellers. We're going to do three stories and then take a little intermission and uh, then have uh, two more. And tonight, the theme of the show is uh, Tales Out of School 2, stories about the New Yorker. And we have five New Yorker writers, and they're all going to tell us um, stories about uh, working at the New Yorker. So I, as a way of introducing everybody, I asked them all the same question. I said, um, what's something about working at the New Yorker that nobody knows? Okay, so our first storyteller said, um, people don't know that we're paid in wheels of cheese and pairs of oxen. That's interesting. Let's hear it for Susan Orlean. Susan? <laughs> We really are paid in wheels of cheese. Okay. Well, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Here I was in a cab racing down Fifth Avenue, and I have to say the cab itself was a big splurge for me at the time, going to the offices of the New Yorker. Now, I, it was, the year was 1986. I was a young writer. I had just moved to New York. And all I dreamed about was writing for The New Yorker. Now, I had actually been writing for The New Yorker for years, um, just the magazine didn't know it. I had finally gotten the nerve to send my clips in. And lo and behold, truly to my an absolute astonishment, I got a call from an editor. His name was Chip McGrath. He said, come on down, we, we should talk. I said to my boyfriend, I'm going to blow my week's uh, optional cab money to go down there in style. I'm kind of excited about this. And typically, when you've dreamed about something for a very long time, um, you hit some bumps along the way. For instance, uh, and I'm not referring to the cab ride. I, I was very nervous. How could you not be dreaming about this for years? I entered the office of, of Chip, this editor who was going to talk to me. Big office, books and manuscripts stacked here and there. And he sat behind his desk, sort of sphinx-like, a paw on each side of this pile of manuscripts. And his face was absolutely registering no emotion. And I was incredibly excited and nervous. And I did um, what I think most of us do when we're excited and nervous. I began babbling madly. For instance, he said to me, where were you living before you moved to New York? I said, well, I, I was living in Boston. And Boston is the worst city. Have you ever lived there? The people are so petty and mean-spirited and racist and, and have this inferiority complex about New York and they're just, it's just, it's a horrible place. H have you ever been there? And I see behind him a picture of a, look like a baseball stadium with a large green <laughs> wall. And he sat there again, sphinx-like, said, yes, I'm from Boston, my entire family's from Boston, as you were saying. <laughs> Nevertheless, he gave me an assignment, and I was overjoyed. I felt like I was, I really did feel that I had been given a visitor's pass to the Kremlin. 
it was truly an exciting moment for me. It was also uh, part of what was exciting was the absolute mystery. And the New Yorker is, I will say, even now, even these many years after I've been working there, it is a mysterious place. And when you're a young writer first entering, there are not road signs and maps telling you how and, and in what way the place works. It also seems incredibly awkward to ask any of those questions, like, how does this place work? It would be like going on a date, finally, with George Clooney and saying to him, are you wearing protection? I mean, you don't, you don't want to, it's the magic, the magic. You, you just don't want to mess with that. Anyway, I, I headed off to, to work on my first story. It happened to be, um, I was into investigative pieces at the time. It was a story about Benetton and whether they hired people who already knew how to fold sweaters or if they actually taught them <laughs> how to fold sweaters. And <clears throat> I, I felt like, you know when you first lose your virginity and you feel like you're wearing this huge billboard and everyone can tell by looking at you that you just had sex for the first time. Well, I, maybe there are virgins in the audience, and uh, believe me, it happens. Um, but I walked into Benetton, and I think there was something about me saying, hi, I'm from the New Yorker. There was this huge billboard that went up behind me saying, she so is not. This is her first assignment. She's really not a staff writer. And for the first and only time in my writing career, the manager of Benetton came over and asked to see my credentials and then actually called the magazine to find out if I really was legitimate. It was mortifying. And it, part of what was mortifying was, of course, I thought, oh, my God, the magazine's now going to think I'm, I'm trouble. But also because I didn't feel legitimate. I felt like such a novice, and I was there on, as I said, a visitor's pass, and I did not have the executive key to this place. Nevertheless, I, I did bust the Benetton story wide open, um, but that's for another moth later. Um, after a certain amount of time, I got the incredible good news that I was going to be allowed to write a full-length piece. And now this involved a, a lot of issues that were less significant when I was doing these talk of the town stories. The piece that I was going to work on was I had met a cab driver um, who happened to be an African king, and I wanted to write a profile about him. I went in to talk about the story with Chip, the, the Sphinx-like editor. And I, I was used to writing for magazines, but generally everything was laid out pretty clearly. And in this case, I was simply told, yes, you, you may pursue this as a full-length feature. Well, I had one question to begin with, which is, um, when's the deadline? Chip looked at me, and I did feel that I was raising an incredibly impolite question, sort of awkward and, and you know, almost vulgar. When is the deadline? Well, he looked at me and he said, when will it be done? I thought, all right, never mind that deadline. <laughs> I'll figure it out. And I actually said, I, I think I need a deadline. He said, well, what, what will your deadline be? I thought, am I missing something? I, 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 I said, well, um, July 14th. And he said, fine. <laughs> There's also this little question of how long the piece should be. Now, the New Yorker then, and to some degree now, but then it was not uncommon to have a 35-part series. <laughs> and 
you know, it was clear to me that there wasn't a, a rigorous attention to length, but I, I did feel that it would be useful for me to know how long the story should be. And I said, um, Chip, how, how long should it be? Again, it was like, oh, vulgar. He said, how long does it need to be? And I said, well, I'm not really sure. What should I plan? And he said, well, how long does the piece want to be? I thought, never mind, I'll, I'll figure that out myself. I began working on the piece. And of course it was a wonderful experience and, and the magic of the magazine was real. But I still felt this self-consciousness of how do you get the answers to some of these questions? How do you know how this place works? Is, is it something that one day, they, like skull and bones, they call you in and they pour blood on your head or whatever happens at Skull and Bones? Or do, do you just know? Do you figure it out? Is it an Aztec code that you crack? How does it work? I, I mean, I had no problem working on my story. I just didn't quite understand the, the rules of the magazine. It was really a mystery to me. As I'm working on the story and the weeks are rolling by and there was something else happening in my life, which was the, the bills were coming in. You know, my rent was due and I had to pay electricity and I, you know, those things and those wild cab rides I was taking. One of the things I had not dared bring up in conversation because who likes to talk about money? Nobody. But I did wonder as month three and four and five rolled by and I was following my African king around, what was I going to get paid? Now, if you take on one hand the New Yorker and everything about it, a high-minded, intellectual, a purity of spirit and pursuit, and on the other hand, a check and I couldn't figure out how to negotiate the distance between the New Yorker on this hand and the check on the other. So I thought, all right, I'm, I'm going to go at this in a very subtle, clever way. I'd come into the office, I'd sit down with Chip, and I'd say, you know, it's almost April 15th. Guess what, guess what happens on April 15th? He said, what? And I said, well, it's tax, tax day. You know, and people have to, like, declare what they've earned. That didn't work. Um, another day I said to him, you know, I have this terrible shopping habit. I, um, I go to the grocery store all the time and buy food. And he said, that happens. I, I tried to come up with every possible way to extract this nugget of information. And it, it was making me nervous. I mean, I was young. I, I didn't have any money. It, I had spent a lot of time on the story. I thought this, it, it's not pro bono, right? I mean, someone would have told me that, right? I just, I couldn't figure out how to ask it. I finally thought, I, I can't do it. I, I just can't. I know that the words would be there, which is, can you tell me how much I'm being paid? Or what do you pay around here? Or there, there would be a way to say it, and I couldn't bring myself to do it. But you know, something happened along the way. I became a New Yorker writer. In my mind, this shift had occurred. And as the bills arrived, I looked at them with that sort of detachment, that mystical, magical, like it will, it will happen, it will, they will be paid. I think I was adopting all the, the tone and manner of Chip McGrath, the Sphinx, which was, it, it, I wasn't gonna bother myself with that, I was a writer. I was really at peace. And, you know, I, mean, the, I had some issues about paying for things, but it, it was okay, I was at peace, I, I was done, I was a New Yorker writer. I think that gave me the, the courage one day to go in and sit down across from Chip and say, I have this question. It's a burning question I've wanted to ask you for, for months. I think he was 
expecting me to say, you know, what's your position on the Oxford comma? <laughs> and he leaned over and he said, yes. And I said, what am I going to get paid? And he leaned back very calmly and he said, Susan, it will be sufficient. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Susan Orlean. I've been working for The New Yorker for 11 years. That must have been so awesome to get paid. That's just, that blows me away. Put that on my to-do list. That sounds incredible. Um, okay, our next storyteller, I asked him, tell us something that nobody knows about working at the New Yorker, and he actually had an observation about the fact checkers, and it sounds like a joke, but it actually is true, which is that the fact checkers are so thorough, they even fact check the cartoons. That is absolutely true. They, I don't know exactly how they do that, but they do. Let's hear it for David Grant. David? So by the time uh, most people pick up The New Yorker, it's pretty clear how the story turned out. There seems to be a logical beginning, a middle, and an end. But the truth is, when we're working on these stories, they rarely turn out exactly as we envisioned. Unfortunately, sometimes things go wrong, even disastrously so. And perhaps nothing ever went more wrong for me at The New Yorker uh, when I set out to become the first reporter, indeed one of the first people ever, to capture a live giant squid. <laughs> now, the story began, as one might imagine, a little bit out of desperation. I was relatively new at The New Yorker and had that same feelings that Susan described. And I was already behind on my contract. And I had a baby boy who was only about three months old. And I was desperate to find a story to figure out how I was going to feed this little kid. And so I was calling everybody I knew frantically saying, do you have a story idea? Do you have a story idea? And finally I called a friend of mine in Boston. He said, well, why don't you look for the giant squid? That would make news. Now, my only idea at the time of the giant squid was from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which was this enormous behemoth grabbing hold of a submarine. And I always assumed it was simply a myth, like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. But I looked it up in the dictionary, and sure enough, the giant squid known as Architeuthis was not only real, it was the largest invertebrate on Earth. It had tentacles sometimes as long as school buses, and it had eyes the size of human heads. Yet no scientist had ever seen one swimming in the ocean or ever captured one alive. Indeed, they only knew these things existed because occasionally dead carcasses, some measured as long as 60 feet, would wash ashore or be found floating on the top of the sea. Now, I was somewhat desperate, but I thought, how can I tell this story? There's nothing to see. But I was frantic enough, and I kept looking into it. And eventually, I discovered that not only are there giant squid, but it turns out there are actually giant squid hunters. Now, this was a profession that nobody told me about when I was growing up. <laughs> and it turns out that these people have devoted their lives, decades, uh, prowling the high seas like Ahab to be the first to capture a giant squid, which to them is the equivalent of landing on the moon. And they do all sorts of crazy things. Like, put cameras on whales, sperm whales, hoping the whales will lead them to the squid. They go down in cages and submersibles and get attacked by sharks, but they always end in disaster. But eventually I tracked down this marine biologist in New Zealand, a guy named Steve O'Shea, who was, has to be the most wonderful character I've ever written about. Um, he turns out to be more obsessed than any of these other squid hunters. In fact, he has collected more dead giant squid uh, than anyone in the world. Uh, he keeps them in his garage sometimes and puts on a gas mask in order to dissect them. Apparently, they're very stinky. And he even had one buried in his garden. And he had come up with an idea. He said, well, rather than try to cap capture the big giant squid, I'm not going to go for the big calamari. I'm going to try to capture a baby. Now, this seemed kind of nuts. Like, you can't capture it when it's 60 feet. How are you going to capture it when it's the size of a cricket? But there was a certain genius to his mad plan, which is that 
Giant squid, like many other creatures in the sea, when they spawn, they hatch many babies. And so in theory, or hypothetically, during spawning times, there should be lots of babies floating around in the sea. They should be shallower, and they should be easier to catch. Not, they won't swim as fast away. So when I called him up, he said, come on down, mate. I'm about to head out on an expedition, and we'll make history. Now, I was desperate, like I said. And so I ran to tell my editors, uh, Daniel Zalewski and David Rennick, who are two of the best editors in the whole world, but like some editors, they have that um, thing where they sometimes ask a practical question, like, if we're going to send you halfway around the globe, what are you going to find? And I fear that in my exuberance and desperation to convince them that it made perfectly logical sense to send a reporter halfway around the globe to capture a creature that had never been captured for thousands of years, I may have slightly just a wee bit oversold the story. And I cited all sorts of things from maps to squid migration patterns to the currents off the coast of New Zealand and assured them as a Shea told me, no, 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 we're going to make history. And so they gave me their blessing and off I went to New Zealand. And it was shortly after I arrived that the ominous signs began. Well, I was imagining some great Jack Cousteau-like vessel, very high tech, something you would have seen in James Cameron. And when I got there, uh, O'Shea showed me his uh, vessel, and it turned out to be a little more than 16 feet skiff with a little outboard motor. It turned out he was a poor scientist and essentially bankrupted himself looking for this thing, and this was all he had. And the great squid squad, I imagine, with all these scientists of guys who looked like they lifted weights, turned out to be uh, just his graduate student who got seasick, and myself, who, as you can tell, is not exactly Captain Cook. And it was at that point he leaned over to me and he said, mate, I should warn you, there's a bit of a hurricane, a cyclone, coming our way. Now, I figured, okay, that's not a big deal. We'll wait. No, no, no. Apparently, uh, O'Shea was not willing to wait because it turns out, and you learn things on these stories that you never know when you begin. And so I learned that apparently squid and giant squid only spawn off the coast of New Zealand during a certain period of time. And if he didn't go now, we would lose our op opportunity. And so we set out to put the boat in the water. By the time this came, there were gale force winds. All the power had gone out on the island. Dams had broken. They had called up the National Guard and the reports of various drownings. Now, I thought at least we'll go out during the day. But again, during these stories, you learn things you never know when you begin. And apparently, you can only hunt for giant squid at night. <laughs> now, the reason this is, is apparently squid rise in the water column to feed at night. And so that's when you can catch them. So we put the boat in the water at twilight. O'Shea hits the gas and says, "Radio, mate. Uh, and the three of us set off. Now it was twilight, and there was a buoy marking the channel. And O'Shea... Uh, pointed to it, and he said, what color is that? Now, O'Shea spoke with kind of a, a little bit of a murmur. He was deaf in one ear from a diving accident. And I said to him somewhat loudly, I said, it's green. Can't you see it? And he said, I'm not just deaf, mate. I'm colorblind. And then the boat headed a little bit further out to sea, and I turned to him a bit nervously at this point. I had just slipped on a life jacket, and I said, where are we going? And he said, over there, mate. And he pointed ahead, and it was getting darker, but I could see some shadows in the water. And I looked more closely, and they were rocks. And there were these enormous rocks on one side and then on the other side, gigantic, jagged rocks sticking out of the water. And the whole ocean seemed to be funneling through this chute, tsunamis of water pouring through. And he said, that's where we're going. Now, there comes a time in any story, and this certainly came to be one of mine, when I started to think about my son, who was three months old, questioning whether any of this was ever worth it and wondering what the hell I was doing out there. But I had come this far, and it seemed too late to turn back. And so we headed into this chute, and the boat started to launch off the waves, and it was like we were stepping off a cliff, and then we would fall down. I lost my notebook. I lost my pen in the water. The whole boat was vibrating. And as we got into this chute of weights, in, in, into the chute with the waves, uh, O'Shea turned to me and said, he's sturdier than she looks. Just, we just can't let him take us broadside, that's all. And I took out my flashlight, and I shone the flashlight in front of me. The boat was being pulled towards uh, the currents or pulling us towards the rocks. And I saw something in front of us, and I shone the flashlight at it, and it was a giant wave of water about 20 feet high. 
I then turned behind me and I turned the flashlight and I shone it upon something dark that was pressing down upon us. And it was another tsunami of wave, about 20 feet high. And it was at that point when O'Shea turned to me and he said, you won't find this in New York, will you, mate? <laughs> and for the first time, I began to wonder if my captain was fully in command of all his faculties. But O'Shea had a certain manic determination uh, and a certain brilliance. And somehow, and to this day, to be honest, I don't know how, he managed to steer us between those rocks and between these gigantic waves with the whole hull vibrating and get us out to a spot that he said was the perfect spot for searching for giant squid. And he got out his traps. Now, once more, people, even reporters, have illusions about stories. And I had an illusion about our trap. I thought it was going to be some high-tech remote thing with all sorts of buttons and electronic things. I was, I don't know, sucking the squid or whatnot. But O'Shea didn't have a lot of money. And so he had built the trap himself. And it turned out to be built with um, plastic empty Coke bottles that he had sawed in half and then welded into this net so that it looked like this gelatinous creature. We dropped that thing into the water. I weighed about 50 pounds. Now, there were only three of us. Now, usually as a reporter, my job is to observe. And I'm a pretty good observer. I'm a passive creature by nature. <laughs> but there were only three of us, and O'Shea put me to work. And I worked with a certain determination because O'Shea had said, I'm ruined if I don't find this thing. And I kept thinking, so am I, buddy. <laughs> So we kept working, and we would pull that trap, we would drop it into the water, and we would pull it out, we would drop it in. Each time we'd pull it up, there'd be a moment of exhilaration. Are we going to find it? Are we going to find it? And then nothing, diddly. And this went on for hours, and our hands began to burn, and the waves were rough. And we did this night after night after night, working for hours. And each time, the next evening, O'Shea would say, we just have to go further. I know they're out there. We go further out to sea into the rougher seas and the rougher waves. By this time, the graduate student was completely green. I was so tired at one point, I curled up in the corner of the hull of the boat and would just simply listen to O'Shea as he grunted. And then finally, after nights and nights of this, one night around 4 a.m. on a moonless night, we were pulling in the trap, and the graduate student said, What's that? And O'Shea looked closer. Heaven help us, he said. It looks like Arky, he said, meaning Archituthis, the giant squid. And I looked at it, and sure enough, I could see its eye. It was small, but I could see it. I could see its eye. I could see its mantle. I could see its bullet-shaped head. I could see its tentacles. And I had never, ever in my life felt such a sense of exhilaration. And I looked at O'Shea, and I could see it on his face, and I thought, we've done it. We've captured the baby squid. And we had to transfer the baby squid into a container in order to transport it. And like I said, we'd been out there for nights. It was hard for us to see, and our muscles ached, and the waves were still rough. And as we lifted up the tank to transfer it, O'Shea was yelling, steady, mate, steady, mate, just hold it steady. And we started to pour it into the container, and suddenly something happened. Where'd it go, O'Shea said. Conway said, it was the graduate student, he said, it's gone. No, no, it was there, O'Shea said. It's there. He began to put his hands into the tank, going through krill and shrimp, looking for the baby squid. It was bloody right there, he kept saying. But it was gone. And suddenly O'Shea put his hands on his head, and he said, it's a fucking catastrophe. And he fell back into his chair in utter anguish. And I confess this now somewhat embarrassedly, but I felt a deeply selfish thought. What am I going to do? We've been out here. I've been in New Zealand for three weeks. We've been out here for nights. I persuaded my editors that we were going to find this thing, and we've lost it. And we headed back in that night. The next morning, we barely spoke. We drank a little whiskey. We had one more night left on our expedition, and I couldn't do it anymore. O'Shea was going back out. I said, I can't go. And O'Shea headed out, and I said, I'm just going to get some rest tonight. And I couldn't sleep. I just kept laying there thinking, how do I write this story? There's no ending. Nothing happened. We had it and we lost it. I said, we're supposed to have this thing in a tank. It's supposed to be growing. And O'Shea came in the next morning. I took one look at his face. He didn't have to say anything. And I knew he hadn't caught it. And it was in that moment when I looked at his face that I realized that the ending 
What I had seen at that moment on the boat was the way the story was supposed to end. Here was this wonderful man who had devoted his whole life to capturing this creature. And he had had it, and like an illusion, it had slipped away. And it was not just the true ending, which is most important, but it was also capturing a much deeper and much more surprising essential truth. And it really reminded me something about journalism and what we do with The New Yorker. That often in these stories, we don't know how they'll end. And often it is the endings that are most surprising, where we don't find what we're looking for, that even seem to end in tragedy or failure, that are most revealing and the most profound. Thank you. David Grant. That was that was an amazing story. I, I really uh, I could I could relate to it here just as a seafaring man. I just um, cause I, well you laugh, but a couple of years ago, actually, the New Yorker uh, sent me uh, to entertain on the Queen Mary two, and uh, yeah, it was rough. Um, and I remember one time I was there uh, in between shows, um, and I ordered squid, <laughs> and they were out. <laughs> the sea is a cruel mistress. It is. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying, David. I am such an asshole. It's just, I amaze myself sometimes. Um, okay, we have one more story before intermission. How are the stories working out for you so far? How are you liking them off? Yes, excellent. Um, now, our, our next storyteller, in addition to being a stalwart uh, New Yorker writer, is a, a member of the best political team on television, uh, which just got a little bit better. So um, we're excited to have him. And I asked him to tell us something about uh, working at the New Yorker uh, that no one knows about. And I had never heard this before, but this apparently is true, which is that um, a number of years ago when Tina Brown first took over as editor of The New Yorker, um, everybody was, was working incredibly hard and around the clock. And um, The New Yorker instituted this new rule to keep people um, at their desks that they could, they could order in lunch uh, at The New Yorker and it would be paid for. Um, and according to him, this resulted in this total orgy of restaurant ordering that was just unbridled, and really restaurant ordering became the main event, um, and writing took sort of a backseat to that. Um, but anyway, here he is, Mr. Jeffrey Tubin. Jeff Tubin. I loved being an assistant U.S. attorney. I was a federal prosecutor in Brooklyn, and every day I got to get up in court and say, this is Jeffrey Tubin for the United States. And that was a thrilling, unambiguous pleasure that, that, that never got old. And I, um, I liked something else about the job. The thing about being an assistant U.S. attorney, about being a prosecutor, if you do it right, and I think we did it right, is that you're always right. You're always the good guy. New York City is a city, at least it was then, that's full of crime. And you could sort of pick and choose people to prosecute, and you only had to pick the guilty ones. And it was just a wonderful opportunity to sort of do right and uh, have an enjoyable and, and productive job. But I also like to write. Uh, and through a strange comp sort of brief uh, set of circumstances. I got hired as a talk of the town writer at the New Yorker uh, after I spent three years in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and uh, I just started started writing stories. It soon became apparent, though, that I should probably, uh, you know, write some things that drew on my knowledge of the law, and 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 I wrote really just one or two stories until uh, June of 1994. I'd really only been at the magazine for a year when uh, the news came over, uh, my wife and I, our, our, uh, our clock radio in the morning, and it said that um, the ex-wife and friend 
of O.J. Simpson had been found murdered in Los Angeles, and everybody was looking for O.J. Simpson. And, wow, I thought this is, this is probably going to be a pretty big story. Uh, and Tina Brown thought the same thing. And Tina Brown was very excited by this case. It was really just an extraordinary situation. And there was the first week, and every, that was the week of the Bronco chase. And, and, and Tina got more and more interested in the story. And it was at the time, shortly after she, she took over the magazine, where she had hired Richard Avedon, the great Richard Avedon, as the first staff photographer at The New Yorker. And he, she sent uh, Richard Avedon and Susan Mercandetti, who was an editor at the magazine who often worked with uh, Avedon, to go out to Los Angeles and take photographs of the defense team that was assembling. So uh, Susan Mercandetti called um, the... Uh, uh, lead defense lawyer at the time, Robert Shapiro, and said, I want to uh, have Richard Ivadon take a team photo of the defense team. And Shapiro said to her, well, you know, the, the defense team is, is sort of in flux at the moment. How about Richard Ivadon just take a picture of me? Uh, and and uh, given the circumstances, uh, Susan and Tina and Richard Avedon said yes, and so they went out to take his picture. Well, at this point, uh, it seemed like a good idea, Tina thought, to have a story to go with it. And uh, since I had, you know, I was a former prosecutor, I, she said she called me into her office and said, you know, why don't you go write a story about this O.J. Simpson investigation? And and. You know, I thought to myself, there are hundreds of reporters out there. What the heck am I going to do? I don't know anybody. I don't know anything. I, I just, you know, just me on that. And, and she said in, in her inimitable way, she says, there's no story in New York. Just bloody go. So I went. Um, and I flew out to Los Angeles. It was, it was 1994. It was the year of the World Cup, in the, which was being played in the United States this year. And I was on a plane full of Brazilian soccer fans who were screaming and drunk and making noise the whole way. And I was thinking, what the hell am I going to do out there? I have no idea what I'm going to write. But uh, I agreed to go. I had only one clue, and it really wasn't much of a clue. I actually, before I left, I put in a phone call to the, my criminal law professor uh, at Harvard Law School, who was a member of the Dream Team, as it came to be called, Alan Dershowitz. And I said, Alan, help me out. What's, in, what's, the, what's going on in this case? What's interesting? He said, and, and one thing he said, I don't know. He says, you know, this detective in the case, this detective, he's a bad guy. Okay. That's it? Okay. So anyway, I, that's all I had. But I figured I knew a little something about cops. And, and, and I thought, well, if he's really a bad guy, maybe he'd been sued. Maybe there was some legal case where he was, you know, violated someone's civil rights. So when I got to Los Angeles, I went to the uh, civil court building. It's downtown Los Angeles, really, just across the street from where the trial would ultimately take place. And I went to the records room. There was an enormous room. It was like a movie set, just just towering boxes and boxes. And, of course, this was pre-Internet. This was pre-cell phones. And I realized there was a problem in, in trying to find these records. Before I went to look, I had to figure out exactly what this guy's name was, this bad detective. And I didn't re I had a, a note, but I, I wasn't sure I had it quite right. So I called the New Yorker's legendary fact checkers. I called my friend David Kirkpatrick, who had checked a story for me recently. And I, and I called him up on a pay phone, of course. And I said, David, check this guy's name in the paper. I'm not sure I have the spelling right. F-U-R-M-A-N. And, and he said, no, no, that's wrong. F-U-H-R-M-A-N. Mark Furman. That was the name of the detective. So I went to the records, and I went to the list. They had a big book, list of defendants, list of plaintiffs. And I went to the defendants, and I thought, wow, you know, it's alphabetized. Mark Furman. Nothing. So, okay, so much for that lead, Alan Dershowitz. But I thought, what the hell, I'll, I'll just check the plaintiffs. Maybe he's had, you know, he sued somebody. And I go through the records and I find, what do you know? Mark Furman versus the Los Angeles Police Department's pension board. I think, what's this? And so I ask the clerk and the clerk pulls down this dusty set of records and I get this record. And the gist of the complaint was Mark Furman had been an LAPD officer for about 10 years and he sued to get to, so he would be entitled to retire with a disability. 
And his disability was he hated black people so much that he couldn't function anymore as a police officer. And there was a deposition that he had given in the record where repeatedly he had used the N-word to describe black people. And I thought, wow, this is pretty interesting. And I went, I went to look at the resolution of the case, and it tells you all you need to know about the LAPD, that Furman lost his case, and they said, no, go back to work. It's true. So I got my roll of nickels, and I made copies of all this. So I thought, like, what the hell am I going to do with this? I mean, it's kind of interesting, but I mean, it's just, it's, is it a story in and of itself? I needed to get to Robert Shapiro. But, you know, Robert Shapiro didn't know me from a hole in the wall. I, you know, he, he was being inundated with phone calls. So I figured, you know, what the hell? I'll just show up at his office. I'll just go there. And he worked in Century City in one of those big office towers. And, and I drove all the way from downtown Los Angeles out to, uh, out to West LA and got to Century City. And, and I, and I went to the office directory. I knew his address and it said Robert Shapiro, 18th floor. So I went to the elevator and I pressed 18. And I, I pressed 18, and I pressed 18. It, it wouldn't light up. And so I went to a different elevator, and I pressed 18, and I thought, God damn it, you know, it's like this, this case has gotten so much attention, they've, like, cut off access to the whole floor. What the hell am I going to do? So anyway, I, 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 one of my weird good qualities, to the extent I have any, is I have a really good memory. And, and I walked over to the directory, the guy who was sort of the – this was pre-9-11, so there wasn't much security, but there was sort of a doorman. And, and I said to him, isn't this the building where Ronald Reagan has an office? And, and he said, yeah. And he told me the floor it was on. And I thought, wow, that's, he's a, a little chatty guy. And I said, yeah, and the famous Robert Shapiro is on 18, right? And he said, no, no, no. His office is on 18, but the reception is on 19. You have to go up to 19 to go down. I said, oh, really? So I went back to the elevators, and I pressed 19, and 19 actually worked. So there was a receptionist, but one of the things I've learned, I suppose, in life is that if you look like you know where you're going, people generally don't stop you. So I walked by the receptionist, walked to the stairway to the 18th floor, and just by coincidence, Shapiro's office was right there. And he was sitting there, he was wearing jeans in his office, and I figured I had one shot. So I went, I, I, I sort of showed up at his, showed off at his door, and I said, hi, I'm Jeff Tubin from The New Yorker. I sure was looking at some interesting records about Mark Furman. And he said, you knew about those? I thought, I thought we were the only people in it. Come in here. I said, yes, that was great. <laughs> and, and, and I said, yeah, I, 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 yeah, the, uh, he said, you, he says, where did you say you were from? I said, The New Yorker. He says, that's different from New York magazine? <laughs> I said, yes. He said, you, you work with Susan Mercandetti? I said, yes. He says, he says oh, Susan's so nice. I, I gave an interview to the guy from New York Magazine because I thought she was from New York Magazine. I said, no, the New York. Anyway, so we started to. We talked for about five minutes. And I said, boy, this is really terrible, this record, th this, uh, this thing that, uh, about Furman. He says, you think that's bad? We think that Furman is such a racist that he actually planted the bloody glove at O.J.'s house and he tried to frame O.J. Now I had a story and I knew it. And I went back to the New Yorker's offices, which were in a big old uh, office building right opposite the La Brea Tar Pits, and I wrote it up and I faxed it back to the office in New York and it ran and it caused, I have to say, a pretty big sensation because this was the first time that the so-called race card was being discussed and Tina Brown with her usual sense of restraint and, and lack of interest and, and, and lack of interest in, in high profile stories rented an airplane that weekend to drive to fly over the Hamptons beaches and on the back of it it said big OJ scoop in the New Yorker and I, I, I love that um, and the story came out and you know it really made my career. I mean, there was just no, no two ways about it. It made my career, but it also caused a great deal of controversy because it said, you know, why is the New Yorker peddling these theories? Why is the New Yorker, you know, encouraging racial animosity in, 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 in Los Angeles? Why is the New Yorker letting the defense team float its theories through the pages of the magazine? And you know what? All of those 
were legitimate questions. And I realized that I didn't care. I didn't care that I wasn't any longer the unambiguous good guy. I just wanted the story. And the story was accurate, and it was interesting, and that was enough for me. And I realized that I probably belonged more in my new profession than in my latter one. Thank you all. We're going to move on to Act Two, but I want to talk a little bit about our writers tonight, because, you know, in addition to writing for The New Yorker, and, and Leo was sort of touching on this, they have all written books. I mean, they've all written great nonfiction books. And one thing I think we can all do um, as, as readers and as lovers of the printed word is, is support writers. And, and one way you can do that is by buying their books. So I suggest that you all go out, you know, to your local, I don't know, Barnes & Noble. You know, I actually did this today. Uh, just because I wanted to sort of um, look into some of the writers that we had to and see uh, what books they had written. I always like to buy books to support writers. And, um, you know, I know people say that, like, bookstores are going to be a thing of the past, um, but I so totally disagree with that, you know, because, like, I think Barnes & Noble, like, you know, just to be able to go in there and and see and touch and feel the books, I mean, without that, like, I don't know how we'd know what to order on Amazon. I really don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a treasure that we have. And they have awesome coffee there. It's just an amazing experience. Um, but one thing I noticed, and I think all the writers tonight, they're all, um, Bud, I guess, has written, Calvin Trillin has written um, some novels, but everybody else has written these nonfiction books. I noticed there's this trend in nonfiction writing, which is new, which is that Nonfiction books don't just have a title, they have a subtitle. I don't know if you've noticed this. Have you noticed this? Like, it didn't always used to be the case. Like, back in the day, like, you know, you'd walk into a bookstore and it would be like Rachel Carson, The Silent Spring. That's it. And you'd pick it up and you'd be like, what the heck is that about? I guess I'll have to buy the book and find out, and then you'd read and you'd figure out what she was after. But nowadays, like, every book has a subtitle, and, and that really starts marketing the book for the, the publishing company, and that frees up the marketing department um, to play Farmville. <laughs> so it's, it's a great, it's a win-win kind of thing. But I went through and I looked, at, I looked at, these, at these, I wrote them down. I looked at some of these books, and the subtitles, I feel like they put more work into the subtitle than into the book, really. I mean, I just want to read a few of these. Here are these are three books I saw at Barnes and Noble. American Chalk. The untold story of how a white, dusty substance <laughs> became the star of the nation's blackboards, educated generations of children, changed the course of history and became obsolete. Now that's a great <laughs> subtitle. You know exactly what American Chalk is about, just from that. Here's another one. I bought this one too, because the subtitle just really hooked me. American Cranberry. The untold story of how a tiny red berry overcame its tartness to become an unforgettable sauce and breakfast beverage, and how it can be good for you in ways you haven't imagined, but probably should. Now that's another great <laughs> subtitle. And this is the last one. I just I bought three books today at Barnes and Noble, all based on the subtitles. Here's a good one. This one's called American Mullet. <laughs> the untold story of the business in the front, party in the back haircut <laughs> that took the nation by storm and how after being cool, it became incredibly uncool and why it may never have been cool in the first place <laughs> and the seven warning signs that you may have one. Now that's a great book. American Mullet, check it out. Are you ready for act two of the show? I bet you are. Okay, now um, our next 
uh, storyteller who has written a great uh, best-selling book. Um, she, I asked her what's something about working at The New Yorker that no one knows about. And this is also true, although it will become very self-evident when I explain it. She said that we New Yorker writers are paid by the word, which explains why the stories are incredibly long. <laughs> Let's hear it for Jane Mayer. Jane? tall for short people. Okay. So, almost exactly five years ago tonight, I was sitting in my car at the curb of a suburban house in Northern Virginia waiting for a ghost. He was not exactly a ghost. He was a man named Mark Swanner, who was 46 years old, who worked for the CIA as an interrogator but he might just as well have been the ghost. I was probably one of the only people who knew his name outside of the CIA, and I also knew his story. It was not a pretty one. It was not a story that Mark Swanner wanted anyone to know or that the CIA wanted anyone to know. From what I'd been able to piece together, it appeared that he was at the center of a grisly homicide in which a Amer a uh, Iraqi prisoner had been literally crucified to death. I wanted to tell this story, but in order to do so, I had to bring this ghost to life, and I couldn't do that unless I could talk to him. So there I was, sitting outside his house, waiting to entrap him. When I was sitting there thinking, I may have to ask this man questions about whether he killed someone in front of his wife and kids when they come home, I began to kind of wonder, you know, what is a nice girl like me doing in a job like this? I mean, I went to Yale. I went to Oxford. I have this really nice family. My parents are here in the audience tonight. They're probably deeply ashamed. Um, and <laughs> I have a husband. and. I have a daughter and I have a dog, and I work for The New Yorker. I mean, most people think when you go to work for The New Yorker that it's kind of like joining the Algonquin Round Table. I certainly had hopes. Um, you know, I, somehow I thought it was going to possibly be sort of like an endless string of cocktail parties with witty, witty repartee and opening nights and fashion shows, maybe sitting next to Anna Wintour. And, um, and, and editors who were going to be wearing bow ties and looking like people in the Peter Arno cartoons. And, um, and that part actually turns out to be right. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but I soon learned, actually, that um, there are other sides to the New Yorker, and one of them is that it is a place of incredible rigorous reporting and a certain amount of very hard work. And I learned this pretty much on my first assignment, which was a book review um, about a book called The Real Anita Hill. It was an absolutely horrible book by a man named David Brock. And I'd written this review, and I was thrilled to be coming out in The New Yorker. And I thought I was sort of ready for my close-up, and I was about to be a glamour girl. But there was only one problem. I was literally nine months pregnant at the time, which is why I remember it was exactly May 1993. And um, far from being treated like a glamour girl, I was literally on the gurney going into the delivery room when I was on the phone with the fact-checking department, which was not taking this as any kind of excuse. Um, so basically, the first thing you need to know about The New Yorker is that the fact-checking department means business. You do not want to mess around with those people. They are the most persistent people. They, they, they outstrip the, the IRS, basically. And for them, childbirth, really, childbirth pales in comparison with dealing with the fact-checking process at The New Yorker. The, the, the second thing, though, that you really need to know is that despite the look of sort of effortless prose in the magazine, behind that, there's an incredible amount of really old-fashioned kind of shoe leather reporting, um, the sort of stuff that makes you sit on a curb on a Friday night at dusk. And so there I was sitting there, and, you know, I read recently, actually, that um, 
Um, Bob Woodward was talking about this, and, and, and he too still does the kind of reporting that requires paying unexpected house calls to reluctant sources. And what was interesting to me was um, Bob basically has identified, he says, the absolute perfect hour to do this kind of interviewing. He says it's, you go at 8.17 p.m., and what you will find if you go at 8.17 p.m. are people who are finished dinner but are not yet ready, ready, getting ready for bed. And so um, that's one thing to keep in mind. In my experience, though, at least in this particular interview, I thought it was better to do it before dark. Um, it was in Virginia, after all, and it's a place where they have a concealed weapon law. And I didn't want to be taken for an intruder. So um, the, the other thing, though, that, that, you know, I'm not really sure what, what Bob Woodward wears when he does his ambushes, but for me, during the Bush years especially, it's been something of a um, kind of a fashion dilemma. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I used to go through my wardrobe sort of looking at things, trying to think, you know, does this outfit make me look fat? But now, I mean, at least during all those years, I would sort of kind of paw through the clothes and think, you know, does this outfit make me look liberal. Um, <laughs> so, you know, should you wear pearls for an ambush? Um, anyway, these kinds of calculations really don't sound very dignified. It, it is true. And, and to be more serious, I have to say, what got me on this kind of um, uh, sort of predatory pursuit was 9-11. Um, I was in Washington at the time that it that Al-Qaeda struck America. And for me, it opened up a kind of a chapter of reporting and, and something of an obsession. The story that I wanted to look at was not just them, it was us. And how were we as a country going to deal with this incredible challenge of fighting evil without becoming evil ourselves? And I really wanted to know, was there going to be a way that we could deal with inhumanity without becoming inhumane? Um, and it was in this line of sort of inquiry that I'd done a number of stories. I was working with some fantastic editors. Dan Zalewski is my editor, and David Remnick's amazing. And, um, and it was at that point when I was thinking about these subjects that I saw a wire story that caught my eye. It was about a strange case, a court martial that had taken place in San Diego, California. And what I noticed about it was there, were no, there was a handful of Navy SEALs who had been tried and then acquitted for killing a prisoner, an Iraqi prisoner, in, uh, in Abu Ghraib. And um, when I took a look at what their, their defense was, it was, we didn't kill him, the CIA did. Yet nobody in the CIA had ever been charged. So I thought, well, this is strange. Uh, you know, does this mean then that the CIA can literally get away with legally killing a prisoner in its custody who's, you know, unarmed at the time? Um, is that where the rules are now in this post-9-11 world? So I wanted to find out more about this case. I flew out to San Diego to see what I could find out, and it really was like tracking a ghost. I mean, it was the strangest thing. The entire court record had disappeared. The court martial had folded, and every scrap of paper had been sealed and uh, been classified. I couldn't find anything out at all. I started calling people who were connected with the case, and lo and behold, it turned out the CIA had made one mistake. Someone in some bureaucratic glitch had actually sent out the court record to every defense lawyer in the case by mistake. When they realized what they'd done, they demanded that all of the court records be sent back to them immediately and that everything be sealed. But the lid was kind of a little bit ajar and the word got around. And when I started poking around, I was able to piece together the story. And the story that I pieced together was pretty disturbing. Basically, what I was able to find out was that in uh, 2003, November, um, on late in the night, this, the Navy SEALs had gone to the house of someone who was a henchman to Saddam Hussein. They pulled him out of his house in front of his wife and kids, and they had tried to interrogate him. They had broken six of his ribs, but um, he still wasn't talking. So at that point, they turned him over to the CIA. And the man who had received him was Mark Swanner. He was working at Abu Ghraib as an interrogator that night. And when he received the prisoner, whose name was Manadel al-Jamadi, Jamadi was walking and talking. 
45 minutes later, he was dead. What happened in that room was pretty hard to figure out, but there was in these documents um, a number of descriptions from the MPs at, at uh, Abu Ghraib, and what they said was that Swanner had put a hood over the prisoner's head, had hung him by with his hands behind his back so that they were strapped to a window behind him in such a way that his feet could just touch the ground and had started screaming questions at him. The thing was, since Jamadi had broken ribs, he really couldn't breathe very well, especially with the hood over his head. And so he kept buckling. And as he sagged, Swanner kept telling the MPs, they said, make him stand up straight. So they'd prop him up, but the prisoner kept sagging and his knees were buckling. And so finally the MP said, I think maybe we better check on this guy. Swanner said, he's just playing possum. But finally they did check on him and they took off the hood and they put a finger in front of his face and he seemed unconscious and they lowered him to the ground. And when he got to the ground, all of this blood gushed out of his mouth. And one of the MPs said it was like a faucet. So by the time I came into this story, two years had gone by and uh, nothing had happened as far as I could tell to Swanner. So when I showed up at his house, I had some questions for him and I wanted to talk to him about what had happened that night. But as I waited there at his house for him to come home, it was beginning to get kind of dark. It was getting really sort of spooky. And I noticed there was all of this uh, equipment in his garage. It looked like gym equipment. I began to think, God, he's probably pretty buff. And um, I wasn't sure, you know, I began to sort of make excuses for myself and think, you know, maybe if this goes wrong, it's going to be embarrassing for the New Yorker. You know, I probably shouldn't be out here. There's sort of a difference between being a reporter and a stalker. So finally, I drove home. But before I did it, I left a message for him in his door, and I said, please call me. I'm trying to write this story. I didn't hear from him all day. So I called him that night at his house, and a very nice-sounding lady picked up the phone, and she handed it to him. And when he heard it was me, he said, don't ever talk to me again, and don't ever set foot on my property again. It wasn't really the kind of full confession I was hoping for, or the other side of the story that would get us onto Oprah. But in truth, it made a huge difference, because Mark Swanner was no longer a ghost. He was now a live man, and we now had a live story. We'd been able to reach him. About Ten minutes later, really no more than that, I started hearing from the CIA. The phone rang and they said, whatever you do, do not name him. So this started chapter two at the New Yorker. I was told by the CIA, if we named this man, he would be killed. That there would be some kind of vengeance taken out on him and it would be on my hands. So I went up to New York and talked to my editors about this, and um, we brought in the lawyer, and she checked into it. And Mark Swanner was not an undercover agent, so none of us wanted to have a Valerie Plain kind of story where you name somebody, um, but he was not undercover. And she said, it's not so much a legal problem, it's an ethical issue. We had to grapple with that. And, you know, the question I guess I had was, um, if I could find him through Google, and I'm not even a particularly good computer researcher. Couldn't somebody else find him? Couldn't the terrorists get him? Maybe it was an excuse, but it was enough of a shred for us to hang the story on. And I sat down to start write, writing, and I led with his nice yellow farmhouse on that suburban cul-de-sac. And with the blessing of my editors, we named Mark Swanner. Um, some people have thought later, that we did the wrong thing. I've gotten some criticism for it, but I just wanted to talk a little bit for a minute about why I'm so proud of The New Yorker for doing what it did. Because basically, at the end of the day, one of the things the magazine is, is a haven for really rigorous reporting. And one of the most fundamental roles of a reporter is to hold people in power accountable. So I felt that this was just absolutely necessary in a democracy we're not the kind of place where people are supposed to deliver justice outside of any legal system by um, executioners who are hiding behind masks. And the other thing that I really thought was important and the reason that I led with the farmhouse was I wanted my readers to know that torturers 
are not monsters. They don't look any different from the rest of us, and they really aren't any different from the rest of us, and that inhumanity is part of being human. And that's why we have laws. It's not just to protect us from the other people. It's partly to protect us from ourselves. So we were back again at the story that I was obsessed with, which is it's about us and it's not about them. So I have to say that none of these kinds of stories, I mean, torture and crucifixion and things like that, they really are not tickets to the Algonquin Roundtable, I found. Um, but, and they're also not really necessarily um, things that make you popular at every dinner party in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, but they, they do have some other compensations. I mean, I've had the amazing feeling at this magazine of doing work that I feel really matters. And I've also had some really unusual compliments. Um, there was one just the other day where I was at a PTA meeting, and another parent came sort of bounding up to me, and he said, you know, you are officially scarier than Stephen King. And, <laughs> and I thought, wow, well, you know, for someone who's an amateur ghost story writer, that's about as good as it gets. Jane Mayer. Well, we have one more storyteller, and uh, I want to do a few thank yous before we bring him on. First of all, obviously, I want to thank all of the storytellers and our musician, Leo Carey, of course. Uh, Le Poisson Rouge, and we all know what that means. There, let's thank them in French. Um, the, the directors of tonight's show, Catherine Burns and Jennifer Hickson. Let's thank them. The producers of tonight's show, Joan Firestone, Sarah Austin Janess, and Joe Krukowski. Let's thank them all. The Moth would also like to thank the festival director, the aforementioned Rhonda Sherman, and senior producer Jennifer Berrios. Let's thank them. And the New Yorker Festival obviously is going on all weekend, so come out and support the events. And the next Moth event, OMG, Stories About the Sacred, uh, will be at the New York uh, Public Library. And I guess information about that is at themoth.org. And... Um, and I actually want to do a couple of personal thank yous because uh, I know I've been sort of a wise guy all night, and that's what I'm paid to do. Uh, if I were being paid tonight, that is what I would be paid to do. Um, tonight I am a pro bono wise guy. Um, but, you know, I moved to New York uh, 15 years ago, and, and two of the really great things uh, that have happened to me since I've been in the city are both here tonight because I started writing for The New Yorker in 1998 and I started hosting The Moth in 1999. They've been both a huge part of my life and I am so grateful for both of them. So let's thank both The New Yorker and The Moth. And one of the things that I'm grateful for is that it enables me to hang out with all these people. And for one night, at least, they pretend that I'm their colleague. And that's so cool. That's so cool that they do that. Um, OK, our last storyteller. I'm not going to try to um, paraphrase what he said uh, is the thing about uh, working at The New Yorker that's, that no one uh, knows about. So I'm just going to read it in his voice, or try to. And he said, um, for the first 20 years, that I worked at The New Yorker, I was under the impression that all the financial arrangements were being conducted in a secret padded room on the 20th floor by ancient female Jesuits with quill pens. <laughs> I think that's true. It's here for Calvin Trillin. But In uh, 1993, when The New Yorker published its first photograph 
of a bare-breasted actress. I got a letter from a longtime subscriber who was outraged at what had happened to this magazine that had been known for its elegant and understated style. And the only defense I could think of was they were small breasts. <laughs> um, so you could say that the tradition of understatement is still <laughs> around. But then I started wondering, why was she writing me? <laughs> was she implying that it was because of people like me that this fine, high-minded magazine had come to this state? Um, I should explain. My father and William Shawn, the second editor of The New Yorker, were born within six months of each other in the first decade of the 20th century. And they had similar views about obscene or crude or off-color language. They hated it. Uh, when my father was driven to the absolute end of his tether, occasionally by his son, he would say, for crying out loud. <laughs> when I was a little boy, I thought for crying out loud was the sort of oath that grown-ups say for particularly dire circumstances. I eventually learned some uh, more offensive phrases, but I would have never used them in my father's presence. And I think I assumed when I joined the New Yorker in 1963 uh, that I wouldn't have used them in Mr. Sean's magazine, uh, which even by the standards of the day was considered pretty straight-laced when it came to language. Uh, according to the recent biography of John Cheever by Blake Bailey, uh, Cheever was told by the Book of the Month Club that the Wapshot Chronicle uh, could not be the main selection of the Book of the Month Club, which was a big deal, uh, if he persisted in refusing to take out one offensive word. Uh, they eventually relented, but not before they reminded Cheever that the same passages had been excerpted in the New Yorker, and he had deleted the word so that the quote, uh, you've just cost yourself a fuck, was printed in the New Yorker as, shut up, Melissa, shut up. <laughs> um, I, um, I started to realize that Mr. Sean and I might have some problems with language in 1965 when I had done a piece on the research into dreaming sleep, and it included the fact that cats deprived of, of dreaming sleep uh, seemed to get intent on mounting other cats. As we were closing the piece, my editor said, uh, Mr. Sean, uh, without insisting, uh, is wondering whether we could find a euphemism for mount. I said, what did he have in mind? And the editor said, making a sexual advance toward. I said, it's a cat. Uh, we're talking about a cat here. We decided to stick with mounts. Around that time, I, um, I wrote what the New Yorker then called a casual, which is a short piece of humor. And in it, I mentioned a maternity dress store in Harlem called Mother Jumpers. Um, Roger Angel, who was then a fiction editor, said that he wanted to buy the casual, but he was pretty sure Mr. Sean would not allow Mother Jumpers into the New Yorker. So I had a talk with Mr. Sean. I, I had prepared my arguments, and I said, that Mother Jumper was itself a, a euphemism. Um, Mr. Shaw was not impressed by that argument. Um, uh, it was an impasse that was um, easily avoided, and, and uh, I took the way out. I simply sold the casual intact to another magazine. Um, 
But the solution in these cases with reporting uh, was not as simple. Uh, in 1967, I started a series of pieces around the country called U.S. Journal, a piece every three weeks from somewhere in America. And one of the first pieces was about Lester Maddox, who was then the governor of Georgia, and it started a campaign to bring virtue uh, of the no blasphemy, no drinking, no mini skirts variety. Uh, to the State House. And I said in the piece that apparently forgetting the campaign momentarily, Maddox had said that the federal government could take its education money and ram it. Mr. Sean said no to ram it. Um, I went in to talk to him about it, and I said, um, I have no burning desire to get dirty words in the New Yorker. Uh, but what you're telling me is that I have to quit listening when the other reporters are still listening. Uh, but, and I don't know whether I could do that. He said he would think about it and let me know in the morning. I went home that evening and poured myself a large scotch and um, told my wife I didn't know what I would do if the answer was going to be no the next day. Uh, I had enormous respect for William Shaw, and I even respected his stand against offensive language. Uh, my argument that the Maddox quote had been in other magazines hadn't cut any ice with him because he didn't care what was in other magazines. Um, and I loved doing U.S. Journal. Um, but I thought, how can we justify withholding information even silly information from the readers. And um, I realized it was conceivable that the New Yorker and I would part ways um, over Ramit. Um, <laughs> relatively inoffensive phrase that had been uttered by a man who, uh, to use a word that Mr. Sean would not have let in to the New Yorker, was a piss hand. Um, <laughs> The next morning, uh, Mr. Sean phoned and said Ramit could be in the New Yorker. Uh, now, I know what you analytically inclined Easterners are thinking. I really did have a burning ambition to get dirty words in the New Yorker, because <laughs> I was acting out against my father, <laughs> who I deeply resented for sleeping with my mother. Um, people from Kansas City don't hold to that sort of thinking. <laughs> and in defense of our way of looking at things, I would just say that Mr. Sean and I had no other confrontations over language for 17 years. When we did, it was around the time that the New Yorker was, as the Wall Street people would say, in play or it seemed to be. There were rumors that the Fleischmann family was going to sell the New Yorker, and it caused a lot of concern in the halls about its future. Uh, a farmer in Cairo, Nebraska, or near Cairo, Nebraska, had run off a couple of deputy sheriffs who came to repossess some of his farm machinery. And before long, he found himself inside of his farmhouse, surrounded by a SWAT team from the Nebraska State Police. And at some point, he said to the person who was negotiating with him over the telephone, it's the goddamn fucking Jews. This is a man in Cairo, Nebraska, who had probably never laid eyes on a Jew. Uh, but as it, the story goes into after that, he had fallen into the hands of some prairie fascists who were preying on farmers with economic problems. When my editor saw that quote, he said something like, you've got to be kidding, or lots of luck, or something like that. And I said, well, I'm going to go in and talk to Mr. Sean about it. Um, but I know he's got a lot on his plate, so I'm not going to get on my high horse if the answer is no. And I went in to talk to Mr. Sean, and 
course, the first thing he asked was, was there a euphemism we could use? <laughs> I said, it's a state police transcript. Uh, we talked about a couple of other unsatisfactory options. And he finally said, just go ahead and use it. So I mumbled something and literally backed slowly out of the office. I was afraid if I made a sudden move, he might change his mind. And it was in the magazine the next week. And I'm happy to say nobody seemed to take any notice of it. These days, of course, you wouldn't notice words like that in the magazine. And as a reporter, uh, I'm grateful that I don't have any restrictions on what I can see and what I can hear, what I can observe. Um, I did a story in southwestern Kansas last spring. One of the people involved was a big man whose tattoos included a life-size hangman's noose around his neck and down his chest, and also a word tattooed on the inside of each of his biceps. So when he raised his arm in the Charles Atlas strongman pose, it said, fuck you. The last time he did that, somebody shot him to death. I would have been very disappointed to have to give up that detail. Uh, on the other hand, when I'm in my own voice, as opposed to quoting somebody or somebody's tattoos, I've never used offensive language in The New Yorker. I've always known that my father and Mr. Sean would disapprove. Thank you. Calvin Trillin. That's our show, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. And as we say at The New Yorker, shut up, Melissa, shut up. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs>